Yeah, welcome everybody. It's really wonderful to see and connect to all the beautiful places in the world that everybody is joining us from. And we're grateful that you've made the time to show up for this conversation, which we're very, very excited for. And if you're just joining us, please do say hello in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from. And a warm, warm welcome to all of you joining us for the first time. I see some new faces and wonderful to see some familiar faces and some friends here as well. And um, thank you for joining us for this conversation on feminine intelligence. I see a lot of women in the space so and some men, so it would be great to hear from you as well. And we're happy to see all of you. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Natasha, and I'm here with my partner, Lorenz. We are the co-founders of Sutra, which is a platform designed for relational learning experiences online. And our intention with creating Sutra is to bring more love and connection into the world. And at the heart of our work is helping creators bring more meaningful connection into the spaces that they create online. And um, our work with Sutra has supported many heart-centered um, individuals and organizations, such as the Harvard Program in Refugee Trauma, the World Health Organization, Pre Presencing Institute, Aleph Trust, I see some of you here, Pocket Project, and more in creating training and learning programs for their communities. And our team at Sutra brings together expertise around education, technology, and awareness-based practices to support creation of relational learning experiences online. So in addition to our platform, we love hosting conversations such as the one today to connect around topics meaningful to us in our work and life. So to let you know, we are recording the session and we'll share the recording afterwards. And we will also have a room for conversation between us in breakouts and an opportunity to ask questions of Karen and Lorenz later on in this session. So welcome to all of you once again. And Lorenz, I'm going to pass it over to you to introduce Karen. Thank you, Natasha. And it's really wonderful to be here. I am very much looking forward to this conversation and very grateful to be spending this time here with Karen. Um, I'll just share a brief bio on Karen in case you missed it in the event sign up. In her 30 year career, Karen has built successful companies, supported civil society organizations to transform entrenched cultural norms, advised business leaders, and led development programs around the world. From her beginnings in health and well being, Karen co founded and built an $8.5 million alternative healthcare enterprise in Australia, whose products and programs touch the lives of thousands of women in five countries. She has authored six books, selling over half a million copies. And in 1999, she was awarded, she was a finalist in the Australian Business Woman of the Year. So um, super excited to have such an auspicious person to explore such an auspicious topic with. Um, and before, Lawrence, just, just yeah. before you get started, can you um, uh, move your volume up a little bit on your microphone? Is it, so is it hard you, to hear me? You're a little um, bit low for me. I just want to make sure that you come out crystal clear. Okay, that might be tricky because I have my audio thing. Um, it's not connected to the computer. Um, okay, hold on. Oh, you sound good? Does, does, give me does thumbs up. Sound, if he sounds good to you, then we'll let it go. Okay, good. It seems that everyone good? can hear you. Good. Okay, good. As long as everyone can hear me. Um, all right, great. So we do like to start our conversations with a few moments of stillness before we dive in. And if it's comfortable for you to do so, I invite you to sit with your back straight and relax your eyes and take a deep breath. Notice the sounds of the space that you are currently in. And bring your awareness a little closer and notice the sound of your breath as you inhale and exhale. Mm 
Begin to follow that movement, noticing the texture of your breathing as it passes through your nostrils and your throat, expanding your rib cage and belly, noticing the shifting fabric on your skin. You might tune in a little deeper and see if you can notice the pulse of your heart in your chest region. See if you can feel that pulse anywhere in your body at the moment, noticing the streaming sensation of your blood flow in your physical structure. And noticing where your physical structure touches the space around you, noticing the point of contact between your body and your chair, between your feet and the floor. Just taking a moment to take a deep breath as you notice those points of contact in the space around you. And I invite you to notice how you're arriving today, anything in your emotional and mental space, just taking a moment to welcome whatever might be present for you. Allowing everything to be exactly as it is. And taking one more deep breath to welcome yourself into this space. And when you feel ready, I invite you to open your eyes. And if you feel comfortable doing so, I invite you to turn on your camera for a moment just so we can all see each other here. And I invite you to notice another person here. Just get a sense of how they're arriving, what might be present for them. Nice to know that even though we're in a virtual space, we are all, in fact, human beings here together, sharing time and space one way or another. Yeah, welcome, everybody. Um, Natasha, maybe you can spotlight Karen and me. So nice to have this time to connect with you, Karen. Thank you for making time. Mm, absolute pleasure. And just welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining um, this conversation. It's an important one for me and I'm sure for many. And it, as we exchanged. Yeah. Thank and you so much. We've had some, I feel like every time we, we connect, we've, we've had some pretty rich conversation and I would love to start our time together um, just by in asking you to share a little more about what exactly is this thing that we're calling feminine intelligence. Well, let's see. I don't have a definition, a dictionary definition for it, of course. But what I've been discovering since I've been doing this work is um, I'm actually going to post it in the chat. I think it's probably a good idea. One second. So if everyone can read, I'm just going to read it out loud. It is something that I came to. Feminine intelligence is a deep knowing that we are all part of a living universe. In an innate sense of responsibility for survival of human and planetary life. The embodiment of feminine intelligence brings the concentration of love, energy and life force to someone or something that is of the greatest importance beyond self-interest. Hmm. 
the first question that comes up for me is how we were using this word feminine and i want to understand what is the implication there you know versus something like just intelligence or masculine intelligence what what's the implication there of the the feminine element because what you described to me sounds like intelligence uh, in in general so i'm 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 curious what what does it mean to be feminine there well, I think I'm speaking um, to this in a contextual construct because the current system that we're all operating in on planet Earth mm. has been all of our sectors of society have been des designed by men, predominantly for men. So now I'm saying men, not masculine. Mm -hmm. So I'm distinguishing between the two. So when I speak about feminine, when we first began FemQ, what we, there were four of us together saying that we recognized that parity and equality kept to get putting, pushing out in the statistics. And now it's up to 130 years is predicted before we get parity or equality between men and women. So I'm speaking about gender. Mm -hmm. Then when we sat together, we said there's something missing that has been marginalized or subjugated out of the human psyche, which is the feminine. It's been said it's soft and fluffy. It's not necessary for decision making. <clears throat> Women had been domesticated. So I'm flipping between biology and the principles or qualities of what we traditionally call the feminine. And that's what became confusing. Mm -hmm. So gender, male, female, and then everything in between, all genders have access to feminine qualities and feminine intelligence. And then the more that I did this work, I started doing, digging a little more deeply and could see and identify that there's actually a cellular wisdom in the biology of the female form. Mm. So in the female form, in the biology of a woman, for example, you and I, Lorenz, could look at the moon together and we would be sitting side by side and looking at seeing, watching, seeing the waxing and waning of the moon and, and be in awe of that mystery. But one of the things that my body has that your body doesn't, I don't think, operated in a rhythm and cycle for 30 years with that moon. And that's a science that hasn't been investigated deeply. So there is an intelligence in the cells of the biology of, the, of a woman and there are, the, there are the female or feminine, I should say, feminine qualities that we all have access to. But there are two very distinct, how I talk about it now is that there are two very distinct ways that we see this. And there is a lot of evidence now that what we've done to our planet, our Mother Earth, is through the eco-feminism eco movement. It was founded in, I think it was the 70s, what we've been doing to our planet is what we've done to women's bodies. They, they made a correlation between the two for centuries, mm. objectifying and um, objectifying the beauty and um, and using women as a resource. Because women's work is often unpaid. So this is why it's a very complex subject, mm. and many will debate and dispute my. Um, proposition that one of the things that I asked myself over the course of my years in working in business and as an entrepreneur is the question I often ask is what is missing that would return integrity to the system as in make it whole again so integrity from a perspective of wholeness not morality mm -hmm. so if we think about integrity from even an engineering perspective if something is missing a crack in the pipeline or a spoke in the bike wheel it's missing its integrity it doesn't function fully so my answer to the question that I was asking myself what's missing in our system what's missing in our society what's missing versus making something wrong it's a much more powerful question to what's missing that if I could bring that it would return integrity to the system and for me everywhere I looked everywhere I worked there was the feminine was dismissed, um, diminished, subjugated or marginalized, whether it was at a corporate boardroom or on the, in the grassroots villages where I worked in India and Bangladesh. So there are many instances where I saw what was missing 
was the softer part of our humanity that had compassion, caring, deep listening for one another and a care for our planet and each other that gave us an access to intimacy and relationship and nourishment and care for one another versus profit and growth. And so I started playing with lots of different distinctions and saying, could we think about seasons? Do businesses have seasons? Like if we want to flourish, but winter, uh, winter is not respected in a business. No business wants a winter. They want perpetual summers. So there's many, many metaphors and analogies we could use to quantify and qualify that the femin feminine flourishing and cy cycles and rhythm is missing in the way that we operate, in the way that we conduct our lives and our businesses. Hmm. There's so much richness in what you said and, and so many so many directions we could go from that conversation. So I'm, I would, let, let's start with the biology element one, because I think that's a pretty, um, we don't talk about that often, but there's something too, for me, that really stands out around the suggestion you're making, that there's an innate biological difference specifically related to the cycles, you know, the, the womb, the, 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 the female cycles that a, a man is definitely not familiar with on an embodied level. And, and I'm curious about what you, what you might suggest the implication of that is what, you know, what, what is it there in that process that, um, that is offered to a woman? I think if I take it for a moment into another direction about cycles, we all, most people on the call, um, I'm sure have experienced jet lag. So that's a disruption in, a, in the circadian rhythm. So our body, we know when that's disrupted, when we don't get enough sleep and we've traveled long distances and our body clock is disturbed. So I think everybody has probably experienced that at some point in their lives. So now say if we take that out of that, we know that and we've had that as lived experience, male or female, we've had that, all genders have had that experience if they've traveled in some degree. So now if we shift that into a biological structure, then my body or a woman's body, if she, if she in fact has had a period or menstruates, has a menstrual cycle, is operating inside a cycle that she is not conscious of. She's conscious of it because she's bleeding, but this is a conversation we can't have openly anyway because it's such a taboo topic. Uh, to the degree now that it's so um, violated and disturbing in India that they've now, many women have stood for and, and have found a way to get a national menstrual day in India, where it's actually publicly announced that this is so. So we mm. would not have, okay. none of us would be here without that cycle. Mm -hmm. So it's incredibly important to profoundly respect it. And yet what we do is we make it shameful. We make it dirty. We make it um, embarrassing. Um, and all of the other words that I could put with that. And unfortunately, um, that happens around the world in every culture. Some, and whether it's religion or culture, there's a perception of that beautiful natural rhythm that enables life to come to life that has been diminished and i'm i'm grateful that i can have this conversation here because i can't have it many places mm -hmm. certainly can't have it in most public forums so i think biologically there is that distinction that we do know cycles exist in our system and that cycle is incredibly important in a woman's biology. Now, the other thing that when I've, because I, I knew what I knew as my as lived experience of working in my own company, an aromatherapy company, it was all built on feminine principles and mostly women worked in that company. Over 13 years, I worked, as you announced in the beginning in my bio, I worked with thousands of women. And one of the things that why it was so successful is what we said is we wanted to return healing to the healers. So women are typically the healers of the home, but the carers, they care for the children and they care for the elderly. 
So what when we started saying that, that healing of the um, of the body and the healing of the self was so important to women's self-esteem because they, many women, thousands that I've met and spoken to, have been diminished or shamed for their sensibilities, their gut feel or their intuition, um, and their sentience. They're actually feeling and knowing that's in their bodies. And when I explored that further, because I wanted scientific evidence for these notions or hypothesis I bring, there's something called fetal maternal, let me just get the, I always get it wrong, microchimerism. And what happens when a woman is pregnant in that 40, 41 weeks, they, there is a circulation of the body of the baby, the fetus feeding the mother and the mother feeding the baby. So the baby, the fetus helps to regulate the mother's heart and the, and the mother's job is to host and keep the baby safe and protect. During that time, the DNA of the fetus goes into the mother's blood, bone and tissue and remains there. Science is now proven for decades hmm. after the baby is born. So I know my daughter lives in Mexico and I have a sense when something's wrong and I don't know what that sense is I can't name it it can't be measured but I know when she's disturbed and I feel it in my system and now there's evidence for it mm -hmm. so unfortunately a lot of these conversations that we are attempting to bring into language into our systems into society to make it permissible, acceptable and respected, a lot of it requires strong evidence. And that's again, much more orientated to one would say, logic, rational mind, which is intellect, not, in, not necessarily intelligence. Mm -hmm. And we haven't got the tools to measure or evaluate these feelings, senses, nuances that we feel and know to be true. And I'm doing my best to bring in the science as well as the spirituality, the spirituality as well as the science and challenge the notion of rational logic and bring in the rightful place of intuition. So there's, I went a long way with the answer to the question, Lorenz, but thank you. I really love the, the example of the, the DNA of your child becoming a part of you and almost like a, what comes up as almost like a quantum entanglement between, between you and, and the child that is, that is very specific then to, to the female body. And so I, I wonder to what extent, because we're, we're, there is a distinction here between what we're talking about feminine intelligence, what is available to everybody in, 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 in some respect. And, and then this deeper order of just being a, 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 a female and, and what's available there. I, I'm, I sense that most of what you're talking about with feminine intelligence is something that's available to most human beings. Would, would that be right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and then we have to distinguish between the different levels because the analogies or comparis comparisons we could make are many, you know, who's qualified to run a marathon, those that train for it. So we've got evidence for what it takes to run a marathon and the training that's involved in the discipline and the mindset, all of that. But when it comes to these more subtle aspects of ourselves, it's very difficult to qualify or evaluate or quantify because we don't have an evaluation system that's been designed for measuring, for example, humility. We, haven't, we don't know how to measure vulnerability. We sense it. We feel like we know it when it's there. We know when we feel safe or don't. But that, those nuances that are highly, um, can be highly developed are not usual in our education system and certainly wasn't in my parenting. So I mm -hmm. think I came to this with the gift of my very... Um, aggressive and I will say abusive father and I was told stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about 
So I'm very early, and I'm sure a lot of people on the call can relate to phrases, if not that, very similar to that, women mm. and men. And therefore, that's why I think the feminine has been missing and denigrated you know, across all genders. Because those softer qualities were not heralded, were not valorized because we were going through war or the, um, the uh, industrial revolution turned us into resources, mechanized everything, gave us time clock, gave us sufficiency, gave us performance. And the personal became domesticated, the very sensitive parts of us. And I've worked, so I give you an example. I worked with women in my aromatherapy company for 13 years, pretty much the whole time with women either in my business or working with them in training programs and workshops I would run to introduce ritual, to reintroduce beauty and self-care and self-compassion, all of the things that, especially in Australia, had been certainly not taught by our mothers or our fathers. Then when I came to England for the next 13 years, I worked in the extractive industries, oil and gas and mining. So. I've had these two huge contrasts of these two environments of one that represented beauty, nurturing, care, healing, and the other that rep represented extracting from Mother Earth and using the resources for profit and gain for the shareholders and the benefit. Certainly it, it subsidizes and, and gives us our environment and our livelihoods in terms of how we function in the system, but the two were I knew I had to armor myself to go into those environments, to be as hard and as tough as those men, to even have a look in the door to be respected. And what I noticed is I nearly had a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. So I reached a point where I just said, I can't do this anymore. And I left the company I was working for and said, it's too toxic not because I named toxic masculinity because I really don't like that term, but the, um, the shadow side of the masculine where a strength is overplayed, when aggression is overplayed, it becomes a shadow. When, and the same for the feminine, when empathy is overplayed, women can become martyrs or doormats. And that's a brutal way to say it, but that's unfortunately what can happen when we're appeasing and pleasing and trying to be empathetic without a balance to that quality. So I think these notions of is feminine accessible, is the feminine accessible to everyone? Absolutely. But I think it's now clear on our planet that this is what we need to bring back in. Mm -hmm. There is a really interesting um... I feel uh, an evolution of both orientations into each other in a sense in that mm. um, the healthy masculine becomes a healthy feminine in the way that it holds space and, and in the way that um, it, it, it cultivates maturity around all of its insecurities and, and is able to, to be strong in holding space in, in almost embodying a feminine capacity. And then the feminine becomes healthy in the way that it's able to um, bring its qualities into in, into a, into a challenging space and hold hold that with strength. Um, but you said something really interesting, almost like a, it's an interesting paradox of sorts in, in the world right now, which is this um, the territory between um, cultivating these qualities and and then our societal demands or needs for evaluation and metrics and you know like how do we know this works. And this is something that we've struggled with a lot with, with our work because, um, you know, I, I know the value of relational spaces and what, what emerges and what that cultivates. Um, I know it implicitly in, in, in my body just through the way that I feel and, and what I sense about the world. Um, but it's hard to measure and come up with some, you know, metric that we can say, look, 90% of people who do this are this much better at this or that. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious about like your, your thoughts about first about cultivating these qualities. Like how, how do we, um, also for me as a man, um, you know, who I am today is very, as a very different person than I was 15 years ago. And, and particularly as I began to cultivate more awareness, there's been a very intentional 
effort to cultivate receptivity to 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 connect with this deeper feminine power within myself and very much seeing that as a power within within myself um but it's it's been something that's been cultivated very intentionally it's a, you know it's like a self kind of a self discipline i uh, maybe using my masculine tendency to cultivate that but um i'm curious about your thoughts about cultivating this thing that we might call feminine intelligence or becoming more available or receptive to it in some way um and and what it what it means to somehow measure that I think um, because I know you a little bit, Lorenz, I, mm. I believe that you have very um, ritualistic, if I can use that word, or disciplines around your spiritual practice. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, only two and a half hours a day every day. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the principles we work with in FemQ, my organization, is... Um, and I think it come with uh, hopefully um, a couple of my team members are on the call with this and, and they can put up some um, links to where to go after the call. But one of the things that we would say is primary is the foundation, is the inner work, is the inner work mm. we do upon ourselves, the ability to be self-aware, self-reflective, understand the implications and impact that one has on another or on the world. And one of the other layers that I've been bringing to this work recently is the unconscious and conscious agreements we make. I'm going to pause there for a moment because most people might be, some people might be sitting on the call saying, oh, I don't agree with what Karen's saying, or I don't, I'm not sure I agree with what Lorenz just said. That's one aspect of an agreement, which is a shared view of an opinion, judgment, or the world, or a belief. That's one aspect of an agreement. But a, an agreement as a verb, as an operating principle, is something very different. So I would say you have an agreement with yourself, not with anyone else. You might have it with Natasha or, or colleagues or friends, but you have an agreement with yourself that you've made that you will apply this discipline for the greater good or whatever it is you say would that be accurate you have an agreement with yourself but that's it. i'm just i'm just trying to really digest what you're saying if i do i have an agreement with myself um that i will apply this um I, that might be one way to phrase it i mean i i i experience it as a as a deep calling, you know, to be receptive to, I mean, ultimately for me, you know, on a very personal level is to, to find union with God. And, and that's my, that's a deep calling. And, and the practice, the stepping into that every day as a practice, um, then what I find one of the biggest um, outcomes of that is, is what I would refer to as feminine intelligence as this is deep embodied receptivity that emerges through all of that practice and, and inner work. Um, and I guess one way to look at it is, is an agreement for me. It's it, 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 the words that maybe come to mind first are, are devotion and, and commitment. But um, I would say there's, there's some, somewhere there, there's, there's an agreement between me and me or me and the universe exactly. and, and God. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that, that's what I would call an operating agreement, mm. that you have a calling. Many people on this call and hundreds that I meet have a calling but they don't, respond, don't necessarily respond to it. They have a calling and then either fear or something or distractions or many things get in the way of actually initiating that calling. And that's an agreement I make with myself that I see something that is calling me is to bring the feminine into mm. social systems I would say is a calling or my mandate. You know, I, even if I go to put it down, I can't put it down. It's a, it's a, it's a compelling agreement I make with myself and the universe, Mother Earth. It's a compelling agreement I've made with Mother Earth. Like a covenant. Exactly. Hmm. So that ag that agreement that we make with ourselves. And to put it in the most simple terms, if I walk into Waitrose here in England in the supermarket, 
I don't usually think that I've just made an agreement, but I have. I've just made an agreement with everything that's in that store that I'm about to pick up and buy. Now, we don't think about our operating agreements. So I was having a conversation this morning with a colleague and she said, what did your nomadic life teach you? Because I, you know, Lorenz, I've been traveling a lot. I lived in mm -hmm. Costa Rica for two years. And I said, culture and context determines how we operate. And so this notion of the agreements we make, I have to make an agreement when I live in Costa Rica that I'm going to live in a particular way. Otherwise, I'm violating something. So I became very aware of going into an environment, whether it's a church, a nightclub, a restaurant, or wherever it is, there is an implicit environment I walk into where I've just signed up for it or I leave. So the operating agreements, I think, that we make with ourselves, and often I'll let myself down on those agreements, as we all do, but more particularly, I speak for myself, is the operating agreements are incredibly important. And I think we haven't articulated those in terms of, I agree, I will operate by some of the things you just said, in reverence to all of life, to dedicate my life to bringing about transformation through relationships. I don't think we often don't sit down and make those with ourselves. Mm. And you sometimes, think that, I'm sometimes I think we're being we're afraid to be called on them, even if we make them explicit. Do you think that that the sticking to those agreements reflects a masculine quality? I think the sticking to the agreements is an intrinsic aspect of all of, for all of humanity. It's not mm. masculine or feminine, but I think the agreements that we do make are very different. So. Like you just described yours that bring and cultivate inside of you the fem what you would call the feminine, much more receptive, much more relational, much more intuitive. Those are the things we've traditionally called the feminine. And I'm, I'm only still calling it feminine because you said my definition could refer to consciousness, not just feminine intelligence. But I keep calling it feminine because it's profoundly missing in respect. It's profoundly missing in the environments we operate in or the systems we've, we currently reside inside of. It's currently missing. Mm. And when I was in Costa Rica, for example, I was working on a project and they asked me to go and visit the communities with them. And one of the reasons is because I have the organisation FemQ and they said, we want you to look through the feminine lens because the women are the ones tending the gardens, they're the ones doing the community gardens because they lost through the pandemic they lost many of the families hundreds thousands lost their income because of hospitality which is predominantly the revenue source in Costa Rica so this project started building and teaching permaculture now when the pandemic was over and when COVID and when people started going back to work the women were still the ones in the garden in the community garden toiling the soil and with their children and feeding the family so when we went in, one of, one of the reasons I went was because one of the highest priorities of this organisation was the empowerment of women. And I said, I kept hearing through the translator about the domestic violence in every single community. And I said to the, one of the project leads, how can you talk about the empowerment of women and not do something about the domestic violence? Because women will stand up and speak out and then they'll be beaten. Now, this is, I'm being very gendered here, mm -hmm. but this, this is a perpetuated cycle of violence because children learn how to treat women. They, women can't necessarily be the nurturers, the soft, if they want to stand up and speak, then that's not how they should be. And the reaction that I got was, uh, it's not our business, it's a private matter. So... If we were to truly integrate the feminine, respect wholeheartedly what the feminine aspects bring to holding the fabric of society together, we wouldn't have domestic violence. And I say, if we would truly bow our heads to where we all came from, every single person on the planet came from a mother, mm -hmm. from a woman, 
they were birthed, they were hosted and birthed. And I think that level of respect, of understanding, of appreciation is profoundly missing. And I know that it's, I'm looking through that lens all the time. And I do see and feel when I was in Costa Rica, it was the first time I'd ever felt I am her. And I'm looking out my window at the moment at trees and grass and I am her. Mm. And I'd never had that experience before embodied. Mm. knowing I am mm. her and so I'm going to deviate for a second just to talk about the summit because there's an event coming up in October as you know Lorenz and what we're building is the intersectionality of climate the climate um, crisis we're facing ecology environment as one focus peace building and building um, gender uh, transforming gender and racial injustice and the third one is right livelihood, earning a living whilst doing no harm. Now, if you bring those together, because climate, the climate crisis is producing more violence, the pandemic increased domestic violence. So all of these causes and effects are a fundamental flaw in the system of where we've lost connection to where we came from and who's hosting us now. I, so in say in the context of, of what you witnessed in Costa Rica, how do you address an issue like domestic violence? Is that is that about public education? Is that about creating holding spaces for men to develop themselves? Like what 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 is a tangible response to that? Absolutely. So um the best experience I've had in making a shift with that was in India when I was working for an organization called the Hunger Project in the 90s. And one of the things that was discovered in research is the chronic persistence of hunger has got nothing to do with food. Chronic persistence of hunger is a systemic social norm that persists, which is women are less, they are a chattel, they're an object, and I have sat in meetings in India where the, a man said, of course you shouldn't beat your wife. What else can you do when the dinner's not hot? I'm paraphrasing, but I was a version mm. of that. So what we did is firstly, women who were sold off as child brides or put into rape camps. By the way, I want to go back a step actually, because there's an important part of the story. When I had my aromatherapy company and I was working with all women, how I got into the Hunger Project is a woman came to me one day who was working for the Hunger Project and said, you're doing an amazing job with all these women, Karen, and what about your sisters? Well, I've got two blood sisters. And I thought she was talking about them. And she said, no, no, no. I mean your sisters in India and Bangladesh and around the world. Mm -hmm. It's like, Ugh! still makes me tearful now. I'm like, okay, tell me more. And then she told me about the chronic persistence of hunger, the research said that it was due to and proven that it was due to the subjugation and marginalisa marginalisation of women. So if women are not included as equal partners in the community, they've given rights to money and their agency, the community doesn't flourish. And that I would say I've got evidence for all over the world. Mm -hmm. and violence will prevail. And so when we went, what the men would do, there would be a group of us and we would sit on the ground and we would do a workshop called Vision, Commitment and Action with the women. So the women had lost any vision for their life. They didn't have a future to live into. They were servants or slaves or domestic, domesticated servants in some form. So when they had a vision for their life, of possibility for their future, and there is so much research when people have a vision and a sense of possibility, they will, their spirit will rise. So when they had a vision, they committed to agreements that they made with each other of how they would support each other and how they would defend each other. And then they took action. So they would create their projects in the community and they had a measurement system of how, what would equal a flourishing community. The men, would work with the men and say, our partners in the West, in Australia, this is what how we work with our women so that our household flourishes and so that our children have a future 
and that our community and our gardens flourish. Are you interested in that? So the men would hold the men's circles, speak about true partnership, mm. and we would hold the women's circles, talking, giving them a sense of sovereignty, vision, and access to how they could change that. Now, coming into domestic violence, most people will not speak out about it because they do consider it private. But we have to report it. We have to defend those that have no voice. And a lot of women will return. The statistics um, in Australia now is that nine out of 10 cases uh, reported by the police are either mental health disorders and they're taken to hospital or they're domestic violence. And the women often go back. It's usually 90% of the time it's women being beaten and the women uh, will go back to their husbands because often they don't have the funds or resources to take care of themselves or they're steeped in fear. So I think there's a fundamental, when we look at violence, it's not just these isolated aspects of domestic violence, Lorenz. I think it's the violence that gets perpetuated against the planet, against our mother earth, against each other. And um, that's where I think is a huge systemic change. And I often ask the question, imagine if fem the feminine was infused into every sector of society, not a matriarchal society, I'm not talking about that. I'm just wondering with my experiment is if every sector of society was infused with these deep qualities of the feminine, like Mandela led with, like um, Martin Luther King, the, they led with feminine, Gandhi, nonviolent, they led with feminine, more of the feminine qualities. They embodied feminine intelligence in their leadership. Mm. How would society look in medicine, in technology, in um, all sectors? Mm -hmm. I think part of the challenge is, as you alluded to earlier, working in um, some areas of business that you know, much much of the of the of the business world can be can be crushing. It's so aggressive and it's hard to um, to maintain the integrity of that feminine intelligence in in a world that um, isn't entirely receptive to it. I know that's something that I experience all the time. Starting as a as a startup founder, is is that um, it's a it's a rough. It's a rough business world out there. And I think that, you know, even going to um, domestic violence in um, low income communities, that there's something there about, you know, men who are deeply insecure and soul crushed that um, translates to, to how they, they might operate. Um, so I'm curious about your experience as a, I'm going to maybe shift the conversation a little bit, but as, as a, as a, as an entrepreneur and, you know, you're, you're organizing this conference, you've, you've, you've built successful businesses. So you've been in the world as, as it is, and you, and, and you are also um, carrying this, this vision for feminine intelligence. And um, where do you see the, the intersection or, or, or how, how feminine intelligence can find a place in our, in our, in our, in our modern business climate. I think the starting point, Lorenz, is um, who we're being, mm -hmm. who we're being. And that, as you said, is cultivated through our practice. As you said, for you, it's cultivated through practice, the deep reflective work that you do and the spiritual um, disciplines you have so I think when we start to consider even if we're not talking about feminine and masculine but we start to think about how things have been so orientated in one direction for example science as the reliable source versus spirit where where do we where do we um, have the balance between the two it's starting to happen where do we look at Ian McGilchrist's work for example that's, this is my approach, is that I have to be very practical in the environments I go into and speak statistically. Because if I just wax and wane about the feminine, I've got no, I'm out the door. I've got no chance. Mm. But if I start to speak about these, the polarised views of how we've orientated the world and how we live, 
to this exacting measurement through the, uh, the left, hand, left side, left, left hemisphere of the brain. Um, and I'm sure many people know of Ian's work. He's considered a great thought leader of our time. This is and, a, just an offer to the audience. This is, he wrote a book called The Master and His Emissary and uh, writes a lot about left and right brain um, relationship and orientation. Exactly. Now, his last uh, writings, which took him 10 years to write, is called The Matter with Themes. And they're two great big tomes um, that I've carried around the world with me. I love mm. his work so much because he speaks how every everything that we've learned through our education, through parenting, through um, most of the way life functions is orientated to the left hemisphere. Mm. L language, logic, rationale, measurement, equation, e equating and being able to measure by what we see, not what we feel. The right-hand side mm. of the brain is much more relational. It has, it's, it's where we go for intuition, imagination, and it's out of balance because what we've done is the left has become, to your reference to the book, the left has become the master and the right brain, the emissary, and he, Ian's work speaks of it should be the other way around. We should start with the right brain, being relational, being intuitive, sensing into, understanding what we're feeling as sentient beings and relating to those responses to the world, making sense of the world. But instead, what we do is we try and figure it out with our intellect. So the practices that we need is things like dance and music and beauty around us, painting, the things that no, no one does in the corporate world, as far as I can tell, unless I show up. So <laughs> and bring my essential oils and talk about ritual and we, I won't speak of the company, but I did an amazing project in 2018 and trained. I had the privilege of working with 1,600 leaders across the business. We led 49 programs called Flourish. And just saying, I just remember, I'm going to tell one quick story. This, um, I, we were having something called, an exercise called Courageous Conversations. And I put a lot of Joanna Macy's work in, which is very systemic, very open thinking, very relational. And um, we had this conversation called Courageous Conversations. And I said to this engineer, we were the group, um, hands up who's ever been told you're not listening to me and every hand up went in the went up in the room their partner had said it or someone had said it to them and I said so there's a difference between hearing and listening and they were curious mm -hmm. and I said well hearing is what you you hear a dog bark or when you're awake at night and you hear something at the window you you're hearing a noise but you listen to music you feel it, you sense into it. So I said, what if, and this one, one engineer was challenging me a little bit, and I said, what if you went home to your, tonight to your wife and said, you know that you've always told me I'm not listening to you. What? And he said, oh, I'm not going to do that. She'd say, she'd divorce me. He came back the next morning in the workshop and he <laughs> said, I did it. I said, what, how did it go? And he said, well, I said to her, you know, all the times I said, that I was listening to you, I wasn't. I was mm. hearing you. I could have said the words back, but I wasn't listening to you. I mm. wasn't feeling into what you were saying. This is an engineer. And I said, what happened? He said, we both started crying. Mm. That's what it takes, mm -hmm. being courageous, mm. telling the truth, being vulnerable. And I, I just feel like that 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 is already such a significant distinction. And Thomas Hubel shares that what makes a space safe is that I feel you feeling me. And and to me, this is this is if I had to maybe point at one thing that if you could just transform that, the rest of the world would transform. Is that there's so much hearing going on in the world? You know, people hear each other, but they don't feel each other. And that's such a big difference. It's something I feel all the time. Where is, is the person with me feeling me? Do they, are we having, you know, it's, you, you have these conversations at different levels. You, I'm sure you encounter people and right away you can tell, is this person hearing me or are they feeling me? Like, where, where are we having this conversation? Are we having the conversation where our whole body is involved or is it just my brain to my mind, to your mind connecting in some way? And I, I feel like that in itself is such a significant transformation for people to 
recognize the quality of, of receptivity that they have, that, that listening is not just something in the ears, it's in the body. Exactly, Lorenz. And one of the other things that I would say is we did another exercise called what do you do with emotions? Now, mm. this was an even split, if not more men than women in this organisation. And what we gave was a whole list and people had to tick the boxes. Do you minimise them? Do you, um, do you bring humiliation and, and shame people? What do you do with emotions? And so they did this checklist. What was evident for everyone is that when their child, because we made it deeply personal in order to get to the point, what happens when you do that with your child? And the consequences, the impact of when like, and I would use the example I said of my father, stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. Then I had, fortunately, I think why I've been an entrepreneur is I couldn't take working for a boss that was going to do that to <laughs> me. Mm. And, um, and so everyone, people started recognising the implications on their relationships and what they did in terms of mental health is when they started shifting that, everything changed. When people would come to work and say, say um, my son's not well instead of minimizing it and stepping over it they were allowed to speak about and they had a ritual of opening every meeting with saying how you, like you did today how are you arriving yeah. and I would even I would introduce the workshop with saying who's ever experienced a winter of the soul and these people were not had none of them most of them did not have spiritual practices so they were like what is she talking about now, I think that's, that's to me, my courage, is I dare to say that stuff in, a, in an environment where it's not usually heard. Mm. And when I said, what's a, do you know what a, season, um, a winter of the soul is when you don't want to get out from underneath the duvet? And everybody would put their hand up. I have had many winters of the soul. And so what do you do with that? Mm. Do you host it? Do you heal it? Or do you suppress it? And it was transformative in how they embraced one another, the culture of the organisation changed. So I think there are many, many ways we can change the system if we're courageous enough. Mm. Karen, I want to make sure that we have enough time for our audience to ask some questions. So just in the last moment or two, I know you have your upcoming conference, FEMQ, which is part of um, creating the space for to catalyze this change and i'd love to have you share a few words about that absolutely so um i've deliberately or we my team and i um have deliberately um created it so that it's a co-creative dialogue so these the people that are coming who are what we're calling catalysts for transformation and we're starting to use this firm, a term because we're going to do a training on it how do you produce a transformation instead of just incremental change, because we truly do need one everywhere. So we are bringing together these different sectors, um, these instead of working on one's own as in a singular way, like peace building, we're bringing peace building with climate action. How do you have peaceful conversations, courageous conversations, transform, transform anger? Sillarel Worthy will be there, who you know, Lorenz, with the mighty heart doing um, workshops that we've got panels Another woman is coming from Cyprus who's working in trafficking and slavery, sex trafficking and slavery. Um, so all of these subjects that are very disturbing, at least from She Changes Climate. And by the way, usually when the word feminine or she is used, men don't show up. And that's, that's one of the things I'd love to have a breakthrough in, that men stand by our side and, like you do, say we stand by each other's side and really work in a harmonious way together. But that's what we're bringing about in the conference. So we'll have experiences and we're using um, many of the creative arts to bring about a deep experience and somatic experience of the transformation we need. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a catalyst for transformation or yearning to be one, um, it's the place to be. So it will all be based on the feminine principles and bringing in the structure and the um, and the support that we need, bringing our full body intelligence, masculine and feminine. Mm. And it's on the 24th to the 27th of October in France, in Strasbourg. 
yeah, the location is beautiful. And I see the, the link has been shared in the chat. So if, um, if this speaks to you, please do check it out. Karen, thank you so much for just an incredible conversation. And, and also, I really appreciate the, the scientific rigor with which you are able to respond to these questions and all the stories and anecdotes um, just create so much richness. And um, to be honest, really, really, really weighed on my heart, the, the stories you shared about domestic violence and um, what's going on in Costa Rica and India, very painful. Um, but here as well, that's the, that's the unfortunate mm, thing is mm. in the first three months of the pandemic, Lorenz, there were 26 femicides. Mm. That's women being killed in their own homes mm -hmm. where they're supposed so, to be safe. <laughs> I want to make sure that we have um, some time for the, the audience to share. So Natasha, maybe you can take us off of Spotlight. So what we would like to do now is actually invite you into triads. And often when we invite people to triads, we see like a third of people drop off. But uh, this is really where the gold is at. First, it's an opportunity to connect with other fellow heart-centered creators uh, in our ecosystem and just an opportunity to make relationships and, and meet people here. Um, and, and second, an opportunity to come back and, and share anything that's emerging for you or any questions that you might have directly with Karen. So we're going to invite you into a triad. Um, and the invitation is just, just to share what's what's emerging for you. Do you have any questions? Um, anything that's come up for you through this conversation, we'd love to hear from you. Um, Natasha, how much time do you plan to give them? We'll have eight minutes so that then we can come back and share in the space. Is that good, Lawrence? And Yeah, it's good. And, and also just so people here know, we're happy to stay a little longer um, if the conversation uh, does, does, does go on. So um, you don't have to feel like there's a, a strong cutoff there. If you want to leave uh, early, you can, but you're welcome to stay a little longer and, and, and chat with, um, with us and Karen. All right, let's do it. See you soon. Enjoy connecting with each other. Just give a few more seconds for everyone to return. Hope you had a nice connection. All right, and when everyone's back, Lorenz, you can just mm -hmm. open it up for questions. Here we go. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I hope that was enough time to have a meaningful conversation with a few other people in the space. And we would love to open it up to hear from you if you have any questions, reflections, anything that's emerging for you, anything you'd like to share. Um, I invite you to click on the reactions button and raise your hand. And then we'll call on a few people to speak. Would anyone like to share? Christina, please. Yes, thank you. Um, listening to, to this is so inspiring for me. Um, yeah, I can't do my video right now, sorry. Um, but um, I see the work that she's been bringing into this world um you know creating businesses with this in mind um and i when i try to think of myself as inhabiting this i i feel like so ready and wanting to create and bring my expression into the world and and bring this consciousness and community and at the same time i'm super overwhelmed and thinking you know there's like a um oh what's that called when you don't yeah like you, you you're trying to act as something that you're not or imposter syndrome that's it yes mm -hmm. or i'm just like so overwhelmed to see the outcome that i want and wondering oh my god what are some steps that i can take that will actually be meaningful um and not just kind of playing at a game um so yeah i would really love to hear like how it was to struggle in the trenches in the beginning to start from zero and get to where you are today and and what is it that kept you going that helped you to keep your vision alive that helped you to feel the aliveness of what your mission is in spite of the difficulties mm. i think um thank you so much for the question and um i would say that 
I didn't finish high school, so I didn't know how to run or build a business. I didn't go to university. I had no formal education. What I did have was um, my training in healing. And so why I'm saying that is I got in touch with what mattered to me. And then when I started listening to what mattered to others, because I was a practitioner, and it was my listening to others saying, what does the world need? What do these people need? Because I was working with women predominantly because of healing. And I could feel them in me. So I think the first step certainly that took me in this direction was one, my own trauma. So I wanted, and many people say the wounded are the healers, the most wounded are the healers and using trauma as a remedy for myself. So I wrote something down before I came into the call of what my personal mission is, and I'm gonna share it with you. It's reclaiming the authority of my conscience, reclaiming the authority of my conscience. And I listen to my conscience. What does the world need? Who do I need to be? And what do I need to do with that? And the last part is, and how do I reclaim the somatic wisdom of my body that I was told did not exist? I was diminished and my aggressive father who used his hand and his mouth to discipline us, I used that part of me going out into the world was my feistiness saying, I won't use what words were that come to my mind <laughs> it's so aggressive but I realized my aggression had to be turned into my humility my vulnerability and my stand for what I wanted to reclaim not what I wanted to fight so I think start listening to your heart what breaks your heart what touches you and what matters most to you and find a community where you can start little by little taking the steps to feel that you're making the contribution that you're here to make, because I think it's all our time. Our time has come. This is it. So thank you so much for the question, and I hope that helps. But please, Christina, if you um, want to text me, um, not text me, email me. Um, I'm wondering if someone put my email address in the chat, but we can do that. Thank you so much. That, uh, that brings tears to my eyes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Karen. Joe? Thank you. Um, first, I want to just uh, share that uh, showing up here today was really upsetting for me to see so few men. Um, I wasn't expecting that and I was shocked by it. Um, and uh, yeah, so I had a wonderful conversation with uh, Danielle where we talked about um, this, you know, the left brain and the problem solving, the analytic side, the right brain, the nurturing, the and, and how those tend to get split into two different parts of our lives and how women tend to, because they get acknowledged, acknowledged for one, they go and do get overbalanced in that direction. And men, they get acknowledged for the other and they get go too far and get overbalanced and uh, unbalanced in that direction. And how beautiful it is when we can find a place where we get to hold both equally in a context um, I just had a dance retreat uh, where that was happening for me. It was lovely. And my question that comes up for, for you, Karen, um, is in, in the FemQ model, in how you are engaging with this, what, how do you hold, what is it that creates humans who perpetuate violence, oppression, diminishing of the feminine what what is the what is the lived experience of those people and how how can understanding that inform 
how we engage in this uh, this quest for transformation. Mm. Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for being here. Really. I was just saying when everyone was in the break that one of our partners for FemQ is She Changes Climate and I was with them in Switzerland a few weeks ago at their conference, 60 people in the room about She Changes Climate, three were men. Mm. And because the word she is used or the word feminine is used, men mm. don't show up because mm. they think it's not their business or it's not for them. So I want to address the thing that you said, Joe. what is it that lies behind the violence I don't know of any man that goes to the pub of a night and says, I beat my wife last night. I don't think that conversation exists in the public domain. I don't think men are proud of it. I think it's a shameful act that they hide or that if they don't hide it, they, they paint over it or lighten, the, um, lighten it in some way. But I think it's a question that you could ask many men because I, I can't even imagine what would 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 take me to do that i have i cannot get into that mindset i don't understand it and there's a colleague of mine um her name is dia khan if you look for her online she's done a documentary called behind the rage and it took her a year to find someone in america that would actually talk to her i think it was a year she said to talk to her about why they beat their partner. And when they went into men's circles with the abuse, it's another form of addiction for many men. And it is predominantly men. I'm not saying women aren't violent for a second, but it is predominantly, it does go because the men have the strength. Gloria Steinem says many things about domestic violence. And um, I think and then what in turn, what it produces is very angry women. Why isn't more being done? Why aren't people standing up for us? Why aren't people protecting us? Why isn't my husband, my family? And if we look at other countries other than our own developed world, it's even worse in, you know, we've got the right, I've got the right to vote. Women can't even drive in, Afghan, in Iran. So behind the rage, exactly. Thanks, Vanessa. I hope that answers, Joe, and I hope you come to FemQ because we may need more men like you <laughs> standing by our side, holding the space for the feminine and being human beings. And I hope I don't have to keep having this conversation in my lifetime. I hope I have to stop. I can stop having it because everything shifts, but it's unlikely. I'm I'm afraid I can't see it quite yet. Yeah, I, so I I'll keep standing for the feminine, and mm -hmm. I'll keep talking about FemQ. I said to Lorenz and Natasha, just as you were in the break, that someone came up to me in FemQ in Costa Rica, because this is our sixth one we're doing in France. And the, a woman came up to me and she said, thank you, Karen, I feel safer in the world because you're here. Yes, yep, thank you. <laughs> keep doing what I'm doing. <laughs> thank you. Mm, Thanks, Joe. Thank you. thank you, Karen. And then Emmanuel, I saw you had a question from the chat. Would you like yeah, to share? Sorry about that. I couldn't raise my hand. Um, okay. But I want to thank you, Karen, and you, Lawrence, and you, Natasha. Great, great, great um, share. My question, Karen, is I'm working in soul, soul, and story regeneration. How to heal our heart and earth simultaneously, and how mm -hmm. to unfreeze uh, our hearts so we can really get into action. Because the for most of us trauma survivor, we are extremely courageous people. We've survived and we have superpowers, but we often think that we don't, the opposite actually. So I've been working on intuition a lot and I've been building my practice of intuition combined with a very steady, strong practice of meditation. And I could see the changes and the results. So when you were talking about the moon cycles, I think most of us have felt that before and how when we reach out to our heart and we ask for uh, decision or ideas or sign intuition is what connects us to the moon to the universe to ourselves to all of us so it's like this amazing companion that we all have we just need to practice it more and i think since the modern times what 
it's been taken away from us, you know, so that we could fit in a corporate globalized world. So we don't think that we know, but we know. So my question to you is, I'm really working on ancestral and indigenous wisdom because I think indigenous people have protected that much in a much healthier way than we have. How do we encourage people to really practice intuition, to really go to their heart and ask the question and keep on going uh, without thinking that we cannot do it because we can do it? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I would say um, I've traveled a lot in the last couple of years and living in Costa Rica. And the thing that um, has served me through not speaking language, crossing boundaries and borders and um, many, many different challenging in, in situations. What kept me in touch with my intuition was nature, was silence. So we have to go to nature and literally lay down on the ground and bless her and thank her for hosting us. And when we fall in love with nature again, she speaks, I believe she speaks through us. Mm -hmm. And that is part of our intuition. It's not we, have, I don't think personally, my experience is I don't have the intuition. Something comes through me yeah. when I'm deeply listening to my soul, when I'm deeply still and I'm sitting on the ground or I'm sitting in the grass or I'm sitting in nature, I'm out of the concrete. And I came back to London and couldn't stay there. I've moved to the coast because I need the horizon. I need the water. I need nature to nourish me. She nurtures me. So I think it's nature. And I think the other thing that I learned many, many years ago is my spiritual studies are in anthroposophy, Rudolf Steiner's work. If anyone knows anthroposophy, I studied his work for years. And my daughter went to a Steiner school. But one of the things that I learned that was very interesting, I chose to go into aromatherapy as my company, as my healing art. And the organ of smell, the, the sense organ of smell is our access to intuition, mm -hmm. according to Steiner and Anthroposophy. So when we use smell, I came into the call today with frankincense on my hand. Frankincense is the oil that connects you to higher self. So bringing the essence of the plant alive in our system. If we can't go out to her, bring her into us. That's what I loved about aromatherapy and essential oils. Anointing my body every day, honoring my temple as a sacred temple. These are all the things that we can take care of ourselves and tap into what we need and what we know. Thank you so much. And one, one more thing I think I just want to add uh, it's like also the dreaming, the dream journaling, you know, how uh, at night, really, I think, I keep on reading and thinking about it, it's, it's maybe the time when we really get so much energy and sequencing and sent to us by the cosmos and how important it is for us to try to remember them and try to maybe write them and just figure out if there's any signs for us in the daytime, you know. I think it's also really exciting. Thank you. A lot of research has all also been done on plant medicine. And I will say here publicly, because I now can say it publicly, I've also worked with um, psilocybin when I was in Costa Rica, and that gave me great access to accessing the trauma. Gabor Mate speaks about the, um, the realm of psychedelics, as do many now, for the healing of trauma. Because I did have a, you know, haven't gone into a lot of detail, but I had a very traumatic upbringing. And that was that gave me so not only dreaming because my dreams can be falsified in some way I can't remember them or access but I did find that that was a huge help to me. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Francesca, good to see you here. Thank you, thank you, Karen, for this amazing work that you're sharing. Something that was really moving with for me throughout your, your throughout the whole session is the sense of power, sense of like power and polarization, like bigger picture power polarization. In this case, we're talking about women and the feminine and the masculine, and there are so many other words that can be used. And 
I'm like it's like it's the image of like a figure of eight and there's an imbalance on so many ways that needs rebalancing so there's a lot of energy going into speaking about the feminine cycles women and I'm, I'm curious about that point in the middle that point of language point of community of because speaking about women and the feminine can polarize and ostracize men and the mask and the masculine. It's like there's a receptivity, the feminine and the female. I'm not expressing this very coherently because I don't have a very clear handle on it. And yet I feel there's something really, really juicy in there as well about <laughs> the like going beyond this gendered language. Mm. something to something else and I'm not quite sure what that is and Francesca thank you for bringing that in I'm so with you and yet we're so far from it that I can't not do what I'm doing because we're so far from the unification we're so far from the the dynamic balance not balance like equal but the biodynamic energy that runs through all of us of the masculine and the feminine even if we call it that whatever it is but remember I started I said earlier on in the conversation I ask my question I ask myself all the time what's missing that if it was provided would restore integrity to the system the big system my system and what's missing for me is the feminine in corporate, in everywhere I've worked, in everywhere I go, women are not at, sitting at the table making the decision making, making the decisions about conflict. They're not invited. That's why She Changes Climate is standing for 50% representation at COP28, because the women are missing. The Indigenous wisdom is missing. The marginalised voices, the voices that can't speak for themselves. And I now say in boardrooms, they say, we can't find the women. I said, we're 50% of the population. What do you mean you can't find the women? And that's when I get a little bit feisty. Come on. And I say, if you can't find the women, I want you to pull up three chairs, empty. One for your mother, one for your wife or partner, if you have one, and one for mother nature. And now make your decisions at the boardroom. Include them. If you can't find them, imagine them. And what would your response be? And what would they be saying to you right now? What would our ancestors be saying to us? What are the future beings calling from us? They're calling us to stand up, bring our courage, bring our heart, bring our humanity and heal. So we're a long way from unity, unfortunately, but I'm so with you. That's why I said, Francisca, Francesca, I hope I don't have to keep having this conversation in my lifetime. But at 65, I think I'm in for another 15 years of it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to add just something uh, here as well on the on the language thing, because it's something I think about a lot. And I really appreciate that what you just said, that I'm, I'm so with you, but we're so far from that. I think that it's very masculine to want to give something structure and definition. And so in a, in a world where we're trying to create this concept of feminine and masculine, just in the process of trying to do that, we're already taking a masculine orientation. And one of the things that has emerged for me through that inquiry is that the feminine is something that can't be defined. And so as soon as you try to, you 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 kind of give it a masculine form in innately just in that process. And, and for a lot of people, that's just so far beyond what they can handle conceptually, um, that it's helpful to have some kind of concept of, of, of the feminine. But um, but it's, you know, it's the mystery of life. <laughs> and Lorenz, just as you say that and building on one Francesca's question, one of the things I went to Russell Brand's festival two weeks ago here in the UK. And one of the things I love that Russell Brand says is you, um, you cannot create inclusivity by eliminating category. Mm. Think about that for right. a second. Just because you don't talk about it. Just because you say we're not going to talk about masculine and feminine doesn't mean you've now got inclusivity. Mm. So you have to be able to name it to get it back in the system. So really, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So much paradox, and that's that's where the power is at. Thank you so much. Uh, Lisa.
Hi, thank you very much for what you're doing. This is the second time I've joined something with um, Lorenz and Natasha, and I'm so glad I came today. Um, so I'll start with my question, which is I'm looking for a place or a platform or an organization where people can come together for open dialogue. And I guess by open, I mean the kind of dialogue that is deep listening that allows for emergence. Um, I'm looking for that because I'm currently not working um, the quickest way that I say it to most people that seems to just not get them to keep asking questions I wouldn't be able to answer in the moment is I'm on sabbatical. But really I've been, I had a job that I absolutely loved. I'm a healer, Feldenkrais practitioner, Tai Chi, yoga, energy, all these meditation I've done over 20 years, had a practice that was had a year long waiting list. And I absolutely loved my work and I was not burned out at all. But I feel this deeper calling for, and I and I do study a lot um, the science and what many call you know the poly crisis, the meta crisis, and things you uh, talked about. And it's just so clear to me that it, we need a complete paradigm shift, and part of it is going to be that the answer won't come from someone. It's going to have to come from this more feminine quality of emergence and you know as Einstein says that you can't get solve the problem the way it was made so we have to that's obviously my paraphrase but I'm sure most of you know the quote I'm talking about and I can just see that I see pieces I get visions about what my most potent role would be and what the world can look like but I just recognize that it it's going to take like a togetherness and I don't know where to go for that and come to FEMQ <laughs> come to the come and join <laughs> us because <laughs> it's a platform exactly what you're describing we have a community call every month I'm not trying to do a plug but I just want people to feel welcomed into this yeah. dialogue okay I'll have to read more exactly what that is because I know so that I can't go to France in October. No, no, no. Check out the website for our community calls every month. Oh, okay. And we'll be creating a community. We have it. We're just starting to our community on Sutra. So here, this is why I love Natasha and and Lorenz building community. Thank you. And and Lisa, my other recommendation would be to to create a space like that yourself. You know, I think mm. that's really what is the invitation to anybody who's on a call like this that if you're on a call like this about feminine intelligence uh, you know there's something going on with you um <laughs> and, you know and 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 there's a deep need for people that have a resonance and a calling and appreciation for this to to convene people in one way or another that may be online or maybe just in person with some people but you know creating spaces where people can show up in this way that you're describing, you know, that the part of it is our need to be held in those spaces. But I, I think also to the, to the extent that, that, that we can to also find small ways to hold those spaces. Like Natasha and I, we host dinners uh, regularly with, you know, 12, 14 people. And we create a space like this and that invites people to share in this deep, in this deep way. We use a prompt. We really love to work with. If you really knew me, you would know. And so we ask each person to go around the table and share and I mean, the stuff that gets shared is just incredible. Like people share this deep, deep, you know, like it's not always dark and heavy, but sometimes it is. And we all just hold space for that. And it creates this deep connection and, and, and space of healing and transformation over dinner. And that's not at all what it's about. It's we're just having a dinner, but that's what it it's what it becomes about. And, and so I really feel like there's an opportunity for all of us in, in small ways just today, I was actually on my meditation app, and there was a quote there that shows up. There's a different quote every day, and today it was from Anne Frank, and it said something like, how amazing is it, is it that we don't have to wait a single moment to start making the world a better place? And, and I was like, wow, that's so beautiful. And how amazing is it that we don't have to wait a single moment to invite people over and, and create a safe space for them to share in a deep way or, or to you know, to, to do that in, in, in whatever way, maybe it's like do an online community, or maybe it's just 
host a nice dinner and, and really create a space for, for deeper dialogue and sharing to emerge. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Karen, thank you so much. Really, really deeply grateful, deep bow of acknowledgement and respect <laughs> your way for everything that you're bringing into the world and the wisdom you've shared with us today. Also a deep bow of, um, of just respect and acknowledgement to everyone who's here, who's participating in this conversation and helping us hold this space. Um, I am so, so grateful. And also, of course, I could not uh, complete this call without a very deep bow of love and respect for my wife, who is my partner in everything and um, makes all of this possible and who has, you know, holds these, these, all of these events with me. So thank you all so much for, for being here. And um, maybe just a quick resonance check in the chat. How are you? What's present for you right now? How are you leaving our space? Just a word or two. Hmm. Lots of gratitude. Thank you. Feeling hopeful, profound hope, gratitude and love, more gratitude, love and joy, hopeful and support, blessed inspired great deeply moved held and mm -hmm. empowered nourished happy to connect with all thank you yeah. so much everyone for staying the course of the delta duration and staying in the conversations bless you all bless you bless you and thank you for the men that showed up to partner and to recognize the feminine that is within you honor that and respect it as we recognize the masculine in all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lorenz and Natasha, for creating this platform that you have. It's so special and so important. And thank you for having me. Thank mm, you so thank much, you. Karen. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, maybe just unmute and say goodbye on your way out. We'd love to hear your voices. Yeah, lucky. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hope to see yeah, you. Thank you. you. Goodbye. Big yeah. soon. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. All is well. Great session. Very much. Great Thanks session. Lot, thank Lorenz. you. And much love. <laughs> Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.